I lost my husband to breast cancer in 2001. My life changed. I had to reinvent my life. My husband had been a physician, and so I knew about medical teams, and I thought, why don't I go on a medical team? Why don't I sign up and go to Guatemala? So I did. I wasn't a doctor or a nurse, so I had to figure out what to do. So I went and worked in the kitchen. I was horrified by what I saw because I could walk around into the surgeries and see exactly what was happening. I saw them remove tumors. I saw cleft, la cleft palate and cleft lip repairs. But I also saw horrible burns. And I also noticed that there were children whose throats couldn't be intubated. They couldn't put the little tubes down their throats because their throats were so choked with creosote, they couldn't save their lives. I didn't like it. It wasn't nice. And I did that for three years, and I was beginning to notice that when our team left, we still had a 1,000 people waiting in line for hernia operations. Why hernia operations? From carrying 50 to 100 pounds of wood per day on their backs in order to uh, have fuel for cooking fires. 50 to 100 pounds of wood per day, rain or shine. I realized that it would be impossible to treat all the people that we were seeing. We were only going for 10 days a year, and we went to a different community in Guatemala every year. So I decided we should try to prevent this, rather than trying to teach all those people. On the third year that I was there, I actually had a young woman speaking Kechikel. She had to have double interpreters in order to, for her to ask us to delay dinner. She wanted us to delay dinner so she could thank the team because her hands had been burned shut at the age of two. And for 16 years, she had prayed for a miracle, and we were her miracle. We opened her hands. That was pretty powerful. So I thought, you know, I'd heard of fuel-efficient stoves, safe stoves, but I really didn't know very much about them. And I knew there were people like me who wanted to come on a trip to Guatemala and help, but they weren't doctors or nurses. So when I went home, I established the stove team to go with the medical team. Now you know where the name came from. Anyway, and I brought 10 or 15 people a year to come down to Guatemala to install heavy fuel efficient stoves. We cut holes in people's roofs to install chimneys. The pieces of the stove were three 100 pound pieces that had to be hauled up the mountainsides of Guatemala where there are 24 volcanoes. So I did that for a number of years and I thought we were doing a lot of good because we were installing 125 stoves a year. But then I did a little research, and I found that the need in the small country of Guatemala alone, just south of Mexico, the need was for six million stoves. I realized we weren't doing enough, and I got very discouraged. I'd been giving a bunch of publicity speeches and talking to people about the issue, but nothing really was happening. But in that time, I had met two engineers, Dr. Larry Winiarski and Dr. Ken Goyer. And they came to my house when I decided I was going to stop doing this work with stoves. And they said, you can't quit. This is really important. And I, I said, I'm over 65. I can quit. I can do whatever I want. <laughs> and they said, no, that's not actually the case. And Ken gave me that little book that you've all seen called Don't Sweat the Small Stuff. So I th they, and Larry said, I'm going to Nicaragua, and I am going to develop a stove for you. What do you want? I said, I want it portable. I want it cheap. I want no smoke. He said, fine. Stay tuned. <laughs> Off he went to Nicaragua, and I forgot all about it. I bought golf clubs. You know, I thought, 
whatever, I'm retired. And, and then about a month later, I got this call. Hello, Nancy, this is Larry. I'm calling you from Nicaragua. I said, hello, Larry. He said, I've designed a stove for you and I've got a guy who wants to produce them and you just have to get down here and see what it's about. And I thought, I don't think so. I don't need to start a factory in Central America. But he said, you just have to pay this guy, Gustavo, $500 a month. And when you get down here, you'll see what it's all about. And I thought, oh, no, 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 no. But I went to my Rotary Club. I was a new Rotarian. I had no idea. So I stood up in front of them as I'm standing in front of you. And I said, um, I'm going to El Salvador. I'm going to meet this man named Gustavo. We have no idea what we're going to do. Who wants to come? <laughs> Three people signed up. Three people came with me. We went to Guatemala. So, I'm sorry, we went to El Salvador. We arrived. There was Gustavo with an Excel spreadsheet of our appointments for the week, starting with the Minister of the Environment. You have to understand, we'd never seen the stove. So off we went in this ratty car, and we drive up to the Ministry of the Environment and show our passports and all that kind of stuff, and we drove in. And Larry was there, and Larry went up to the whiteboard, and he started explaining the stove. And he said, well, you see, it's based on the principle of the rocket elbow. The wood comes in here, cold air comes in underneath, the fire's way back here, and the heat comes out at 1,000 degrees. And there's no smoke, because there's complete combustion. The vice minister looked at it, and he says, well, let's see it work. I was in a panic, you know, okay. So we went out to the car, we dragged this little stove, which is about yay big around and this tall. We dragged it into the backyard of the Ministry of the Environment. And the Minister of Environment came out with a pot with a liter of water in it. We lit the stove, there was no smoke, and it boiled a liter of water in under eight minutes. That's about the same as a microwave. The Vice Minister said, oh, this is great. Looks a little bit like a toilet, but I think it'll be acceptable. He said, uh, we have about five and a half million dollars for a project like yours. What's your capacity? <laughs> Our capacity was two stoves. So we figured we weren't ready. So the four of us went back to this little Jesuit hotel where we were staying, we were $25 a night. And I can remember being out in the parking lot with these three guys around me, and they're going, you can do it, Nancy. You can own a factory in El Salvador. And I'm like, no way. No way, honey. So, OK. So then Jerry Riker says to me, you know, we've got a great product. We've got a guy who wants to produce it. We can raise money through Rotary. Let's just place an order of stoves with him. That'll set him up with a factory, and he'll produce them, and you don't have to. I was like, OK, that's working for me. <laughs> so that's what we did. We wrote our first Rotary Grant, and we started a factory with Gustavo Peña. So one of our first clients, as you will, who received a stove was Betty. Betty was an indigenous woman living out at a place that we call Riverside, because it was on the edge of a river. Anyway, um, and Betty was so enamored of the stove and so worried that the factory wouldn't succeed that she took the bus to the factory every morning to work at the factory so that she'd know how to make a stove in case the stove factory failed. But the stove factory didn't fail. This year, the count is 20,000 stoves that they put out. But we didn't... <laughs> Thank you, but we didn't stop with one factory because then we met Marco Tulio from Guatemala through a friend that I'd known from my previous work. When I first met Marco, he had one stove in the lobby of his home. I, lobby is an extreme sense of the word. There was a little area in front of his house. Anyway, he had produced one stove by himself. I burst into tears in January when I was there. He has a 22-acre factory he has 22 employees, and he produced 4,000 stoves this year. He's also, thank you, he's also, because he's local, invented a couple of extra types of stoves. And just so you know, these local factories have had a ripple effect. 
Gustavo, with the profits from the sales of stoves, has put his son through orthodontic school. Marco Tullio and his wife, Ana Luisa, have started a school for children who had no previous education. We were there in January. So, so far, our little organization, Stove Team International, which has one employee, and the rest of us are all volunteers, we've started eight factories in four countries in five years. Right at the moment, the count is that they have put out, and I'm cheating here, I've put out 44,600 stoves impacting and hopefully bettering the lives of 334,000 individuals in Latin America. So it's really been a wonderful ride. I didn't do what normal widows do. <laughs> I've never been normal. Uh, but I'm really excited to show you a video that's a trailer for an upcoming uh, feature on NOVA. They make this world black. My hands were like grease. You couldn't wash it away. The pots were black. The air was black. It was impossible for breathing. We have seen forest reserves in three years completely gone, not a single tree standing there. Three billion people use biomass, so wood, dung, charcoal, agricultural waste, and they cook those on very rudimentary open fires. That smoke kills roughly two million people each year, mostly women and children. So that's double the number of people that die from malaria each year. The most dangerous activity a woman in the developing world can undertake is cooking for her family. And most of them have a baby on the front or a baby on the back. So that baby is inhaling so much smoke it's equivalent to three packs of cigarettes a day. Cooking on an open fire contributes more black carbon to the atmosphere than all of the cars and the trucks in the world combined. To make a ton of charcoal, it takes about 10 ton of trees. The forests are just vanishing. The production and distribution of ultra-clean cook stoves that nearly completely eliminate smoke, and reduce fuel consumption. This new stove, look at this with your eyes. There is less smoke, and it uses much less fuel. The black is gone. I feel healthier, and my children, they are no longer sick. What's the best way to design a stove to reduce smoke and increase performance? Our goal is to really bring researchers, designers, engineers, business people together so it takes all of these people all under one umbrella to get the right stove into the hands of women. Normally a stove product, you go down there, it's totally screwed up, the design doesn't work, it uses more than the open fire. I mean, it's just like a thousand things go wrong. We're, you know, mentally prepared for Corruption. So stuff's going to get just lost, held up, arrive, broken. I reckon everything that can go wrong will go wrong. The scale is huge. We need to make not just 100 million stoves by 2020, but we have to serve 100 million families. To really serve 100 million families, more like 300 million stoves. I mean, this is off the chart. By manufacturing cook stoves, we're going to save thousands of lives more than 100 million trees. We're going to create local viable jobs and we're gonna reduce indoor air pollution for millions of women. It's an incredible opportunity. We hope you join us.
you can all do this. I'm just an ordinary person who, ha who wanted to help one indigenous girl. But look what happened. Thank you.